It's okay. Six pack lap at that. We got Jonathan Garcia, America's 66 kilo national champion. And my dude, you are heading back to IPF World Championships once again. And um, I was just saying, the last time you were on the podcast was April 2022. And at that point, you were saying, I remember you're telling your story. First off, your background story is phenomenal. But we can put a pin in that. We'll get to, get to that in one second. But your background story, for anyone who didn't hear that podcast, is as riveting a background story as anyone's going to hear. I remember that we could get into that in a minute. But you were 33 years old. And I remember you yeah. saying, this This could be this could be it. You know, yeah. you're, you're, you're a... <laughs> You're a father. You're 33. Yeah. You've been weightlifting for your entire life in sports. Uh, chasing the Olymp- yeah, we chasing the Olympic dream to everything you've. We'll get it. We can talk about that again. But um, and I remember we could talk about the world championships. Then this is pre bench rule, which probably could have changed things for your world championship run in 2022 because you came in possibly. silver. You came in silver, yeah. to Eddie Berglund. I think I shocked a lot of people when that happened too, because I think a lot of people were expecting me to maybe, maybe touch the podium, but they weren't sure where I was going to land. I think I shocked a lot of people. Um, it was a great competition. Hindsight's twenty twenty. I wish we could have pushed it here and there, but I was super happy with the performance. You know, second is definitely not what I trained for. And I love what you said, you know, on the commentary of that competition. It was like, maybe for other lifters, the world record would mean something. But Jonathan Garcia is here to win worlds. He's not here to just break a record and be satisfied with that. And that's something in your commentary that kind of stuck in my head. And I, it, was, it was, you were 100% spot on. And you, because you, you felt like you had... Like, a, I remember you saying it's like a clock winding down almost like at 33 years old. You don't got time to mess around. If you're 23, mm-hmm. you have God knows how many world appearances possible. Mm-hmm. But to be in your mid 30s, full time job. I mean, you yeah. work your ass off. Um, a family man, married with children, mid 30s. And you would think your progress is not what these other cats coming up are. And mm-hmm. you're like, I don't got time to play around. Every world appearance might be my last. I got to make true. it. I got to make it happen. Yeah, you got to. Yeah. And, and and that's not to get ahead and talk about this nationals, but that's where my mindset was with this nationals. And um, it it, it kind of clicked and I'll go in more detail. But, you know, for me, I always said that I would stop lifting or, or I would never I'm never going to stop lifting, but I'm going to keep pushing it. And as long as a whole year passes and I'm, and I'm gaining strength, then I know that I'm not at the peak just yet. So, I mean, every year I'm seeming to get more stronger and stronger and stronger. And I always said that if I went a whole entire year, my total didn't go up at all. And I didn't go any stronger or get any stronger than for me. I knew, okay, now it's time to maybe hang up the cape. You know what I mean? Um, but it hasn't happened. I just, I kind of keep holding my breath and waiting for it to happen. But I mean, every year I've progressively have gotten better and better and better. And that's just stemming from my first appearance and, uh, USA powerlifting to, to now, you know what I mean? It's just gotten so much better, uh, uh, through, through the years of just grinding. And this is a weight class where you definitely have to grind at, you know, every, Every nationals is a is a battle. Uh, you, this weight class is insane. Uh, like in terms, I can't believe how stacked the sixty sixes are globally, as well as at, at the U.S. national level, at the world mm-hmm. championships. My like from all over, from mm-hmm. whether it's Sweden, France, Japan, Thailand, to obviously U.S. to and U.S. could send two guys easy. Um, to okay. just this nationals, this mm-hmm. nationals coming into this, you had from Daniel Clements to Brian Lee to um, the other Garcia Morgan to yourself to Austin to um, Charlie to I mean it was th- it, it all you guys are capable of doing seven hundred kilos and up, 
and mm-hmm. seven oh five won the world championships. Coming into this nationals with that field, are you paying attention to all these guys? Because I know you don't. You're not paying attention to powerlifting on every single weight class, or at least you had Yeah, yeah. Okay, a- so that's absolutely not. Yeah, I lo- I love you, but I don't even follow King of the Lifts. Why you don't follow King I, of the Lifts? I I, I I don't I don't because let me tell you something. Um, okay. Winners focus on winning, right? And all that shit is just distracting to me. I don't give a shit what, no disrespect to any lifter. Pan is doing, Charlie's doing, Clements is doing. That has zero effect on what Jonathan O'Brien Garcia is doing at the gym. Does that make sense? I am focusing on being the best lifter I can be. And all that shit is just noise and distraction. Everybody posts, you know, I mean, I do it too. This has been the most transparent and open I've been in my training. I po- I mean, I've posted everything. I even posted my body weight. I wanted it to be known that I was coming in hot. So, you know, typically lifters will say like, oh, you know, hide stuff and things like that. And um, for me, I'm like, why well, hide it? This is the best my training has been. I'm going to show it off. You know what I'm talking about? And I'm going to put everyone on notice and make everyone walk around in pins and needles. But I don't follow powerlifting like that. I, I love the sport, and I have a lot of respect for other lifters. But, again, if I see something in training of someone hitting a big deadlift or hitting a big bench or something, that's not going to be conducive to my specific goals upon that day and my mindset for training. I'm there to have the best meet that Jonathan can have, and if I've got other noise and, and distractions in, in the background, how is that helping me at all? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I just think that a lot of lifters get into the politics that Instagram and, and all those kind of crazy posts can be. And 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 I said this a while ago in a post. I was like, I really don't give a shit what your total is because it doesn't matter unless you do it at body weight and you do it at a competition, period. Like, that's cool. You know, I've posted me squatting 635 pounds before, but does it matter? No, because I haven't done it in a, in a competition. So those posts, and while I get why those guys do it, because, you know, obviously you want to get like your name riled up. And say, oh, my God, did you see this? The, the, the maxing for Instagram, it's not my thing. So I just kind of stay away from those kind of posts as much as I can help it. That makes sense. Do you do you? Pay attention to the results that they've posted. Like, were you aware what Brian Lee, Daniel Clements, Morgan, their previous totals were? Or do you avoid even checking that out? Uh, it's, it's, that's none of my business. Wow, man. It's, I have hats not, off man. to you. That, Holy shit. Let me tell you something, man. Winners focus on winning. And all that shit is just distraction. I'm focusing on what I can do, how I feel on the day, how my training going, how my diet is going. Those are variables that I can control, you know? And I'd be lying if I said that I didn't see another 66 in the past do a big lift. And I'm like, oh, shit, you know? And for a moment, it think make me think about altering my training that day. I'm like, no, 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 no. We have, we have a game plan. And the game plan is to win on the day. Don't alter your training. Don't do a heavier post because someone posted this and nah, that, that stuff right there. I think one, I'm too old for that shit. And I think a lot of the younger cats get caught up in that game. They get mm. caught up in the light game and the re in the reshare game. And for me, my big lifts are saved for the platform. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I've posted big lifts leading into nationals because I wanted to put everybody on notice and let them know I was coming with heat. Regardless of who was showing up, I was going to have my best day. And if I did, I was going to win. So that's a little bit different there. And um, But yeah, man, just, you know, I, I don't follow any of that stuff, man. I just, I just really don't. It just doesn't affect me. So you, when you came into this nationals, you were completely unaware who is who, who is a contender, who's not, how stacked this is. Because the hype on it, I don't even, uh, you wouldn't have even seen the intro video of me and SPD shot for the Nationals then. Because obviously, you'd be in the warm-up room and that's when everybody's going to see it is on an online stream. But this mm-hmm. Nationals, this Nationals, Jonathan, absolutely stacked, full of killers, an absolute shark tank full of killers. Mm-hmm. And 
you would have been totally unaware. <laughs> you were swimming in a shark tank. Yeah. This, and the waters were chumped, my friend. The waters yeah. were appropriately chumped. And you were completely just aloof swimming in there like, all right, it is what it is. I got to do 100% regardless anyways. Regardless. Yeah, but, you know, somebody could post them squatting. Obviously, you know, I'll probably have the world squat record for a long time in, in, in this weight class. But somebody can post them doing 300 kilos. I mean, not, how does that affect what John You know what I'm talking about? My my mindset, brother, is I focus on the shit that I can control, and everything else is just white noise to me. You see what I'm saying? And yeah. that's just something I think that's come with maturity and me being a veteran in, in the game. Because when I was younger, I might have let that shit affect me. I don't follow any other other 66s. You know, I don't. For me, brother, that's, again, just, I go back to what I said, it's just noise. I focus on what I can do and the variables that I can control. And it's funny because, like, Arian, too, he'd be like, hey, we're, we're going to have to fight. There's going to be a tough battle. But he doesn't dive into the, okay, this guy did this on this day. I know he does, but he knows me well enough to know, like, Jonathan doesn't really need to because yeah. he's just going to do what he can do on the day. Yeah. He's, does that make any sense? Yeah. It's good to have a guy like Matt Gary, who's going to be the head coach, Mm-hmm. He'll, he'll let him do all the scouting. Let him do yeah, all the game yeah. planning. You'll execute. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, when, when you have when you have a relationship um, with your handler and your coach, it's kind of like, okay, they know what you can do because obviously you guys have had text conversations and then things like that about how training went and so on and so forth. Um, so that that trust has sound like a two-way street. Okay, you have to trust me. I'm going to execute, and I'm going to trust you that the number that you pick is going to be the number – that we need to win. And th- that was something that me and Ari in this competition were like in a, in just like that perfect flow and that perfect rhythm. Um, did we sandbag a little bit? Did we max out as much as we possibly could? Absolutely not. You know, there's anybody who watches that knows that there's plenty of room on the bench and there's plenty of room on the deadlift. But again, I trusted him to be like, hey, we don't need to unveil all that just now. I'm going to put you in a position to win. And that's how we went out there and executed. And one thing I really liked that you said um, going into getting out of my second bench, you were like, um, let me see exactly how you said it. You were like, and this is how national championships are won. Make lifts. Just make whatever's on the bar, make it. And math is math. And at the end of the meet, you're going to fucking win if you get all of your lifts. And um it just ended up exactly how you said it, which was it was pretty cool how you kind of like foresaw that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, look at Arian has been he's been national team coach for Team USA. He's been your personal coach for years. When did you first hook up with Arian? You were gonna ask that. I think it's been like six years. Actually, yeah, we talked about it. it, it we talked about it. I did. It was like six years. You know, over wow. six years. Yeah. And it's been yeah. a, a nice climb ever since. I mean, this is yeah. your finest performance. Oh, yeah. You know, and um, going just backtrack a little bit, and I'll tell you if uh, if you want to hear just the story of the days leading yeah, yeah. into Nationals. Yeah. All right. This is going to sound like absolute bullshit, but it's 100% the truth. I almost put out, pulled out of this competition. 100%. So I have a small back injury that's kind of rears its ugly head. It reared its head in Africa after my my third bench and so there was just kind of give you the short and narrow of it so um i'm herniated disc on my lower back got that checked out it's degradation from all the years of heavy training and every now and again it'll flare up i don't know if you've ever had a bulging disc but once that inflammation gets to a certain level and it touches that nerve it is almost crippling pain yeah. and and it happened it, and it, the craziest thing it, it happened uh not even like during a heavy single just like a warm-up you know what i'm talking about and i didn't lift anything an entire eight days before the competition oh anything, shit. anything. like no three sets of three you know anything like that and i talked to my wife the night before uh, I left, and I said, babe, I, I, I don't know what the fuck to do. I was in a state of pain where it hurt to lay down. It hurt to sit up. And I shit you not, the day before the competition, I could not bend over and touch my toes. 
Oh, because wow. that once that disc inflammation gets, it's like a bubble. Once it touches that nerve, it is, it's pretty painful. And then the sciatic runs from your ass cheek to your bottom of your feet. And I was so nervous, man. And I said, babe, I don't know what to do. I don't, I mean, I don't want to go out there. This is frustrating to say the least, because this is the most perfect my training has been. My diet is perfect. And now this fucking shit happens. And she said, you owe it to yourself to go. And I said, but what if I go and I don't do well? She said, then you go and you, and you go and you do the best you need to keep it together. And I went and I spent the entire two days in that hotel room. I felt like I was in a box of just stress, rehabbing. I mean, ice, baths, um, uh, hot soaps, just every hour, every hour. Ice bath, 20 minutes, hot soap, 20 minutes, and stretching 20 minutes. It was just that for an entire two days. And if you notice... Um, on the bench, I use bench blocks yeah. because I physically, because of that back, lower back arch on the bench, physically could not touch my feet to the ground and lay on the bench without excruciating pain. So Arian says, I talked to Arian, I said, man, this is, I'm feeling a little bit better, but I don't know how to, I, I, I cannot get into that bench position. He said, fuck it, let's just use the blocks. And bench what we need to bench. Even if you need a flat bench, I know you can flat bench at least 390. And I said, I said, all right, fuck it, let's do it. And if you notice, and, and this is maybe more insight than I need to put, but um, if you notice, I take a few seconds to get off the bench each time. I don't just yeah. shoot back up. And I was in, I would say... My wife will laugh at me because she's a nurse, but I was probably about seven out of ten pain. But I didn't let it show. I was because about to you're say, in a battle, dude, you, you, you're... your poker face was phenomenal, man. You didn't want Bubba, to give these that, guys courage. Bubba, that 66 Nationals, it was a fucking battle, bro. And if you're in a battle, you never show weakness, ever. I want one of those cats to see me like this motherfucker is just unstoppable today. Three for three, six for six, nine for nine, you know? So, mm -hmm. again, that's that poker face. Like you said, you know, I, I just, I showed nothing on my face. And um, feeling how I felt, performing how I did, really just kind of like cemented in my brain that I'm going to be world champion this year, period. I mean, that's just, it's already happened. You know what I mean? We just have to wait till the clock runs up. But, I mean, to perform how I perform, I mean... You know, obviously doing the lifts that I did, feeling how I felt. I mean, if I feel even just a little bit, imagine if I felt great. You know what I mean? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, oh, I mean, if that's you operating under that kind of pain, I, and, and you're right. Like they say, the worst thing you could do, this is what Mike Tyson even said. He's like, I would get in there and guys would be scared to death and they would fight like they would fight like they were scared to death. And he's mm -hmm. like, the worst thing you could do is give a coward his hope. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, even a coward becomes brave. Mm -hmm. Give him hope. Give him something. Give him a reason to believe there's a pathway. So yeah. when you're in the when you're in it, nah, you don't show, you don't mention, you mm -hmm. don't put you don't grimace. Mm -hmm. Yep. You are, you got to take away all the hope and drive like you're a monster out there. Mm -hmm. And another thing that came to you that, that, showed up on the day when you needed it was the deadlifts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the deadlifts were there and mm -hmm. the scouting report on you you would hit some big deadlifts in training um mm -hmm. held them and i remember all of us saying if jonathan could hold on to those deads he's gonna have a, a big day but it's oh, all yeah. gonna come on to a hitting that depth for the squat you go you go three for three you're, you're almost almost like gavin aiden with you yeah, go three for three in that. squats you're tough to beat, but mm -hmm. then it'll come down to those deads. And what mm -hmm. happened? How did you get your deads where it is? So I do something, and I know that a lot of people have have, have seen it, but I guess not really kind of zoomed in. I use I do something very unorthodox, which is hook grip, but I don't I do hook grip double over or under oh, over. Wow. Yeah, 
so it because I got small hands you know I'm four foot eleven I'm a small guy and they're fat and meaty because I'm a power lifter so I was you know um oh just real quick I have to say this that is nowhere near how much I can deal with. I know I posted that, I know I posted that but that is yeah I'll just leave that at that wow so I have, yeah I you're have, gonna bring it on at world <laughs> what if I need to if I need to if so so here's here's the thing with getting my deadlift where my leg strength had o- had always been at you know because if I if I could squat 650 then I could get you could sure deadlift over six right i mean the, the leg strength is there it's the same muscles right just kind of right. these different ways but um oh yeah um so the lift that i posted was um my second lift and i'll just leave it at that because there was a third lift that i did not post that was oh. not pretty substantial pretty it shocked me i said you know what let's just fucking go for it i'm feeling amazing let's just go for it um i did not even tell you know aaron's gonna listen to this and laugh but i had had even sent it to him because i wanted to have that conversation with him if we needed to be like hey put this on the bar and let's go ahead and win this competition but we were already leading by a good little bit but so i was just like let's just let's just do that one feeling how i'm feeling let's secure that i know i can get that weight and going forward so because as you said each lift got more convincing. So, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. It's wild how that happened too. How the lifts get more and more convincing sometimes. I kind of always been that way, right? Like I just feel like, like, like my. It's funny in all my competitions, uh, the first squat always feels the heaviest, and then they just get lighter from there. So I don't, I don't know why, but, and same thing with the deads, like that first one, uh, I think it was like 250 or whatever it was, and then just kind of going up, but, but I'll leave the squat, uh, the deadlift kind of there. Um, and if we need to bust it out in Lithuania, we will, but that's kind of something I'll just keep in my back pocket, a little ace in my pocket. But uh, man, just to answer your question, just hook grip and intense, intense training. There is a day in my training where it's 100% just focused on grip strength. And it's not necessarily grip strength because hook grip, you're grabbing your thumb on the bar. But it's painful, as anybody who's ever done hook grip knows. And you, know, you have to keep hammering the technique and hammering those exercises to keep you know, the, uh, the strength in your thumb to, to pull that weight. And once I resolve that issue... Um, it's really opened up my deadlift to where I think my deadlift, obviously anybody who's followed my career has always seen it as kind of like my Achilles heel. Um, I think now it's um, it's almost like a sword and shield. We have another another tool at our disposal that it's going to just be like, wow, this guy's, I can't, <laughs> I can't beat this guy. So, And of all the times for you to be doing this, I don't know if this is a, like- what is the second wind, a third wind? Like you just, you just a keep. Fifteenth wind. Your fifteenth <laughs> wind. Like the winds are blowing like a hurricane, man. But of all the times for you to keep coming back, this year obviously now a qualifier for World Games. It's a qualifier for Sheffield. Um, mm-hmm. It's and the division is absolutely stacked with stars too. People care about the sixty sixes. There was a time when. People wouldn't be looking. They wouldn't look at the six and sixes. You know, they they the lighter weight classes wouldn't get the attention that the heavier weight classes got. Not the case anymore. Mm-hmm. Now the six and sixes is one of the most popular weight classes for people to look at. Absolute battles everywhere. And now you're in your prime, hitting the biggest totals possible. Where Sheffield is on the line, where World Games is on the line. It, I know from the previous podcast. Your dream initially as a teenager was the Olympics. Mm-hmm. How much yeah, does it mean? Uh... To... Yeah, you were chasing, you were even at the Olympic training facility. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I lived at the Olympic training facility in Colorado Springs. And you met Michael Phelps there. I met a lot of, I met a lot of, I met a lot of guys there, you know, 
that that was such a cool experience, you know. But as an 18-year-old kid, I didn't quite know what I had, you know, like I said in our previous kind of conversation. Um, but as as an adult and I and I look and I reflect upon it, it's always just a fondness. In the beginning, I was like, man, I, I really fucked up, you know, I really kind of like gave up, you know, a great opportunity. But there was a lot of things in my personal life, you know, my dad had just got out of jail and him and my mom was having issues and I was worried about my mom, and my girlfriend that I had back up, just so much stress. If I had been just a little bit older, I think I could have overcome it, but came back home and the rest is history. But no, that was an amazing experience. Anyone who's ever, I mean, even if you can just go tour the facility, I know weightlifting is not no longer there anymore, but it was just a, such a cool experience. And I'm so just forever grateful to my coaches at that time and uh, who just kind of put me on that uh, in, in the right place to kind of um, get invited out there. It was an amazing, amazing, amazing experience. But yeah, I mean, the World Games. So um, when when I was talking about retiring and I wasn't sure, you know, what what my path was with 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 powerlifting and continuing or not, you know, um, that's something that Arian told me too. Man, he's like, man, it'd be a hell of a fucking ride, you know, win nationals, win worlds, Sheffield, and then World Games. That could be something that you could uh, hang the cape up and be like, you know, hey, I'm proud of that run, you know. And um, so that's that's kind of like that's I think this is going to be my season. No disrespect to any other lifter out there, six to six, but there's just no way to fuck me. This is my season. I mean, it just is. I mean, it's just it, you know, with with my son here and, and everything, you know, um, I made some promises to him. And Dad's got to remember. You, I mean, obviously you're planning on winning, but just so you know. You- podiuming gets you to world games and Mm -hmm. um sheffield they're taking wild cards on top of that for people who are potentially breaking world records so that's you regardless anyway so (laughs) you just gotta go there and do your do your damn thing and obviously the last sheffield did you watch the previous two sheffields um absolutely yeah of course you know sheffield man that's that's, that's, that's our super bowl that's what do you mean that's our all-star game super bowl I mean, it's a whole freaking show, man. SPD puts on, I mean, that that whole thing, even if you weren't a power, power lifter and you had no idea what the fuck powerlifting was, that is the most awesome competition just to watch. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, and it, 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 it's, okay, so sorry. No, 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 no you go. Okay, well, mm. I was going to ask. So did you watch the world championships last year in Malta, the 66s? No, I didn't watch it. Wow. Okay. Wow. No shit. Bubba, Bubba, I stay in my lane. I stay in my lane, Bubba. And, you know, and I had some, I remember, I I don't know if you saw or followed on my page, but I, right after I landed from last year's nationals, I had to get an appendectomy. Okay. You, okay. So I've seen some, give me some details though, because I do follow, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell I know, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, a week before last nationals last year in Austin, Texas, I felt the most incredible pain in my stomach. Like, what the fuck? And I attributed it to just, I ate something bad. So I didn't lift weights. I did not train my last week of peak because I just had this weird stomach pain that, you know, I was not to be vulgar, but like vomiting. And I'm like, man, I must have ate something fucked up. You know, I missed a week of work and I didn't train. I didn't like do my last peaking week training. And um and then it went away. Like just like it went away. And I said, oh, man, that's fucking weird. You know, and then um then nationals happened. And then as soon as I got back, I went to work and it just came came over me again. I'm like, holy shit. But this one it was dialed up to eleven. Long story short, emergency appendectomy. My appendix was like inflamed and it could have burst and it could have killed me and all this shit you and will die if that me. happens by the way you yeah i know you become septic yeah so they they rushed me from my job to jacksonville baptist and they did the appendectomy and then so i was in a weird mental spot because you know i had just severely underperformed at nationals um I'm super bummed about that everything was going great and then boom that happened and then now 
I got this doctor telling me, um, you can't lift for six months. You know what I mean? And I was like, no, you mean 90 days, right? And he's like, no, I really recommend. And with your build and physique, I, I can tell you're not going to listen to me. But I have to tell you, I have to do six months of no training. So um, what I do, like any other lifter would do, I sign, for, I sign up for a competition um, three and a half months out. Uh, and that's, not, why, not that's just, why I went to the Caymans. Yeah, North American Championship too, <laughs> not just any. And you were yeah. you were one bench press attempt away from breaking the world record. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't want to do it there. Um, that's a conversation me and Harry had. I didn't want to do it there. I could have deadlifted more and broken the world record, but I didn't want to do it in the Caymans. I wanted to do it in the National. Because there was, there was more in the tank on bench. Or, or not, sorry, not on bench, but definitely the deadlift. Uh, my deadlift has been a lot higher than what I've been doing the past, or what I did at the Caymans for a while. But I was scared because there was still some stir, um, some pain here on the deadlifts. So we kept it modest. Um, but yeah, I mean, so I had my epidectomy and I was on the platform like three and a half months later. Because for me, I hit this state of like depression because I'm like, holy shit, man, all the progress that I've done and all the work that I've done is now going to go ways because I can't train. So I really gave it just like a month and a half of no lifting. And then I went balls to the wall getting ready for uh, the uh, NAPF uh, competition. And, and which was 703, crazy to do. But. That 703, you, you posted up 703 and 705 won the world championships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you were right there with every that it was and it's international, international judging, et cetera. So mm -hmm. it showed that you were still right there and in the hunt, if nothing else. Yeah, I really needed that competition for my mental state. I really did. I I, I hit kind of like a, a darker place because I'm like, you know, again, just super bummed out um that how whatever happened in nationals and then having that surgery. Um and then I said, I just I can't believe it, you know, but I, I needed like a goal, you know, I'm a very goal oriented person. So, but if, so if I'm like a limbo, or just like, I don't really have anything else going on right now. And then you can slip, you know, like any man can. So I was like, bet, let me go ahead and sign up for that competition. Even though I physically cannot lift. When I signed up for that meet, I couldn't do any bench press or squat or deadlift. I was just doing little 30 to 40 pound dumbbells sitting on an incline bench. Cause that's all I could do without it causing physical pain. And um, I just, it's almost weird because I performed so well and it's almost like my body needed that break because I hadn't took such a long break before that I came back feeling super strong. And I said, let me just go to that meet and let the chips fall where they may. And it is what it is. And let's just go and, and put up a total. And, you know, it's NAPF. So it's not like, you know, like I'm going to get invited to Sheffield or anything like that because I did great at this meet. Let's just go and try it. And I ended up having, until that day, the best competition I ever had. It was, it was, yeah. it was pretty, pretty surreal. Yeah, it's crazy how it <laughs> all works out. And it is, it mm -hmm. was perfect timing. It came up in August, which is not long after the World Championships, same summer. And it's like a mm -hmm. reminder if anyone forgot about you. Like, no, I'm still here. Yeah, yeah. I'm still here. Yeah. And yeah. in the total, you put up 703 at an international level for a 66 and reminded people we are capable of. Now, when it came to Sheffield and it was Pena and Kyoto, were you interested in, in when you watched it, what was your impression of Pena, Kyoto? What was your impression of the competition, the production value? Is it, what are you thinking? Because finally we got some 66s in there. Eddie Berglund mm -hmm. didn't really lift as a 66 when he got his way. Um, I, I, from from the production value, I mean, SBD, like I said earlier, does a phenomenal job. I mean, SBD is doing everything with, in, that, in, in their power to put power lifting on the map, and I think they're doing it in a huge, I mean, just extraordinary way. I mean, obviously, I've never gone and lifted, but just I could only imagine the electricity in the air, you know. I mean, place is packed. I mean, it looks like, I mean... Olympia level crowd, you know what I mean? And uh it, it just just from watching it, I was in awe, like holy shit, I think. And just the idea of it, like everybody versus everybody, regardless of weight class, I just think that's 
It's so cool. It's, it's like our Super Bowl. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, as far as watching the other competition, um, if I can be honest, I was a little disappointed in them. Um, you know, uh, they, they put, again, they fall into that trap, I think, where a lot of cats fall into is posting big-ass lips, but not doing those big-ass lips in the competition. So it's like, yeah, all aboard the hype train, but everyone get off at the at the meet. You know what I mean? So, but no disrespect to any other 66 lifter, you know, not bashing anybody. I'm just saying that, you know, um, I feel like it wasn't an awesome representation of what the 66s are capable of. But, you know, again, as each lifter, you you do your best on the day. And I think that these guys, if I'm getting into like the other 66s, I think a lot of them are, if I'm just being honest, um, they're just past being able to be in this weight class. And it shows, you know, if you look at previous 66 performances, it's like you did this and then, then your, your real meat total is so different. What's the variable there? And as a 66 myself, I know the answer is you're cutting too much fucking weight. You know what I'm saying? And your your diet or whatever your training leading into that, there's there's something there. There's something that Ed Cohen said a long time ago, and I absolutely loved. He said, and, and I live by it. If your training is right and your diet is right, you should never miss a lift in a competition. So I think they did okay, but what I'm trying to say is um when we're on that stage and, you know, wanting to represent the weight class in the best, in the best light. Um, I, guess I, I guess I'm trying to say, like, I just can't wait till I get That's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I was, I was telling Jesus at Nationals um, uh, that um, we were kind of chatting a little bit. And I said, if I had gotten invited to this Sheffield, I probably would have declined it. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you know I, it's not fair to my wife. You know I had NAPF after Jace was born, so leaving there, then I would have had Sheffield, then I would have had, uh, well, I probably would skip nationals, but would have gone to to worlds. That's just so much strain. Uh, that's so much traveling internationally and leaving her alone with the baby. I I think that would have been a little too much. Right. So I probably would have regrettably turned down Sheffield because, you know, we're a team unit and I just feel like that's a little, that, that would have been really just a little bit too much far away from family. Well, that, that's respectable as like a family man who's got obligations. You know, like, look at, I, I family have, first, brother. yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't abandon my wife too much. <laughs> like, I can't, if, like, Hey, I'm also going to, I'm going here. I'm going, I'm flying all yeah. over the world. <laughs> it, the only way it's worth it is if you're collecting a massive bag. Yeah, for sure. No, for sure, for sure. If it was a huge bag, okay. But this is, I mean, looking at, obviously, Sheffield next year, then there's China in 2025 for World Games. I mean, you might have some traveling coming up. Um, maybe your son will be ready, travel ready with your wife to come <laughs> along. I don't know. That but... would be absolutely fantastic. And you don't want to hear something funny, so, so I'm not just a little personal here. So my son was born almost two months early, so he had to be in the NICU for a little bit. And, um, you know, I, didn't, and, and I don't know, it, just seeing my son like that hooked up with wires and everything, and, 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 and that was my, you know, I sat with him the night he was born and um, had a conversation, you know, with him. And, and you know, I was, I was proud of him for fighting the way, you know, he was fighting and, and having to come so early. And um, and uh, I, made, I made some promises to my son that I would, I would do that he'd be able to call his dad a world champion. And, um, you know, that made me work harder than I've ever worked before. Um, and um, I'm looking to make good on that promise for him. And nationals, I felt like just was like the first step. Nationals, if I'm being honest, it meant anything to me because I already knew I was going to win it. And, you know, um, the world championships is being world champion um, is everything. And, and, and it's, it's not a matter of, I might. It's a matter of I'm going to definitely. And um, it's funny how everything works and just how life is. I compete on his birthday. What? <laughs> yes. June 16th, man. I compete on my son's birthday, on his first birthday. And 
And if that's not a sign, Jonathan, I just got. Chills. I don't know what it is. Yeah, dude, if that's not a sign, dude. I don't. He's born three days after me, bro. I'm thirteenth, and he's sixteenth. So if that's not a sign, I don't know what is, bro. And they can give me my medal now. Dude, no, I got chills, bro. You, this is crazy. You, for you to be bedside with your son in the hospital, seeing all those tubes in him two months early, which for anyone listening is extremely early, um, and you to be bedside looking at your son saying, I promise you, your dad's going to be a world champion, to winning nationals like you did with an unofficial world record in a shark tank and then looking at the schedule and seeing oh my god yeah. i compete on my son's birthday this mm. is this is uh yeah I, I don't know if you've seen the last dance with michael jordan and the chicago bulls mm-hmm. michael jordan's dad was murdered in the finals to the championship he promised He'd win for his dad, who's no longer with him. That championship game seven fell on Father's Day. Mm. You couldn't have mm. written. You couldn't have written. Yeah. 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 And, and, and yeah. He, he held it together and just did his job and won. And after it was done, he allowed himself to, to, to break down and just reflect and be like, oh, my God. It was, uh, it's weird how it works. What a story yeah. you just told me, though, Jonathan. Your road yeah. to Sheffield is going to be phenomenal. <laughs> um, let's win. Let's win worlds first, and then I'll worry about yeah. Sheffield. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, when I when I saw that, so so obviously like we're in a big like Instagram group, so like so everybody the like, communication is super easy, so the coaches can just tell, you know, post it there and they tell everybody. You know what I mean? Pretty pretty straightforward. So when I. Saw- you saw that I almost started crying. <laughs> you can't make that shit up. I will be competing uh Sunday, June sixteenth, which is my son's first birthday. And um and I still I mean nationals were just just the first step and I still gotta make good one until my little boy. So um I am going to win this world championship. It's not a it's not a if or maybe or but I don't care who shows up with their best day. I don't care if Jesus the size that he's going to lift on 66. I'm going to find a way to beat him. <laughs> like, Brother, you're going to lose today, man. David versus Goliath. Um, so, um, not to keep picking on his he's just such a cool guy. Man. Uh, I like him a lot. From our short interactions we had, uh, we've had, uh, he seems like a really cool fucking dude. Um, the whole U.S. team is super cool and stacked, man. You know? Um, it's crazy. Russ is back. Be- Perkins is here. It is in Jesus, obviously. In Jesus' speech, by the way, when he grabbed oh the mic. Oh, my God. Come oh. on, man. Come on, man. Wild. Come on. You could have played the Avengers theme song in the background, oh. baby. Come on. I got, I got fired up. I said, let's fucking go right now. Yeah. Let's book the flight. Right. I'll lift in the front yard. I don't care. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I was ready, dude. I'm, yeah. I'm, so, I'm so excited and honored to be part of this team. I know, I know with the hype train is real for Team USA right now. The hype train is real, and I'm here for it, and I'm super honored to be a part of this team. I mean, I don't know who posted it, but somebody posted something that was like showing the current world record versus all the men's side, and most of us are either past it or right on it, and we have a potential to do an entire clean sweep I just winning, man. Which um, is crazy. <laughs> that's so fucking cool, man. So I'm excited, and uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, you ever you ever see uh, CT Fletcher? Do you know who that is? Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, all right. I think I think my attitude or Team USA's attitude is going to be, which you motherfuckers is going to come in second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because all you motherfuckers know who's oh, coming in second. you motherfuckers yeah, yeah. better be fighting who's coming in second. Yeah, so yeah. I, oh, man, the hype train is so real, dude. But, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, th- my mindset, man, it's, 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 it's kind of crazy. Um, and, you know, whether this will be my last run or not, I'll let fate decide, but 
in my mind, I kind of feel like it is. So that's really clicked in my head um, that we're not saving anything for the return trip. You know, we're what all What a way to word it, dude. That is, dude, you with the sound bites right now, first off, but <laughs> we're not saving anything for the return trip. Wow. Yeah. Dude. And as an athlete, brother, you know, I've been an athlete more than half my life. I've never felt like this before, if I'm being honest with you. It's, like I said, I'm not saving anything for the trip back. And if I do decide to hang it all up and leave my shoes on the platform, in my heart, I know that I gave it every single fucking ounce I had. And I would have zero regrets. And say, I could have, I should have, could have. And yeah, I'm just saving anything for the return trip. Okay? And um, and one thing I do want to say too, um, because I know she'll hear this later, is you know just my wife and her, how awesome she's been. You know, mothering my 15 year old and my nine month old. So, um, and allowing me to still have my time in the gym, still, you know, allowing me to travel and just have the most fun. I've ever had in these competitions here lately and doing it with such grace and respect and just being my absolute solid rock. Um, I would absolutely not be here if it wasn't for her. Um, just being so fucking rock solid, dude. Um, when I had my appendectomy and I was going through like a little bit of depression, I'm like, what the fuck? And this is bullshit and it shouldn't happen. You know, she sat with me and said, everything happens for a reason. You're going to bounce back even stronger. You're going to surprise yourself. And, and she did. I mean, I, and I did. She was absolutely right. And the same thing when I hurt my back before this national. She was like, just go. You might feel better. Just go put up the best total you can put up. And then you know you can be proud of it. Because I had never, ever thought about dropping in the competition before. Ever. Never. But I just was like, I can't have another bad showing at nationals like I did the year before. I just can't. For whatever fucking reason, I just cannot. I don't. Mentally, I could not handle one really bad show. And um, just man, Jessica has just been, and, and it's um, it's funny. I I had to text her this because I I couldn't I couldn't tell her this without completely breaking down. But you know that national championship is as much hers as it is mine because while she wasn't on the platform with me lifting the weights, she is the reason I was there. And doing as well as I was doing and succeeding in the way I succeeded. Because when you have kids, man, it's a lot of stuff with kids. And you know, she, you know, I've got two sides of the spectrum. I've got a teenager and i got a newborn. And without her handling all that like a champion, it wouldn't have allowed, allowed me to be a champion on the platform for I, I, I don't know if, if people don't know. I mean, your your story, how you she helped raise your daughter and i mean from you 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 telling your your story is freaking the riveting underdog story if there ever was one in ter- everything jonathan from like in terms of like an inspirational story you were a teenager who your father was coming out of prison and it was you had an olympic dream that you had to put on hold and you were the mother of your daughter left you to raise her alone and you put aside your olympic dream you know we skirted over that earlier but you sacrificed for your family to an extent like everything got put aside from your mm-hmm. father returning home to raising your daughter working your ass off and just maybe none of this is going to happen in my life and then you meet your wife, and at some point you decide maybe it isn't over yet. And for your daughter to see you and your wife working ten hour shifts, coming home and and hit the hit the garage and and just doing it like a workman, like just to prove like let this these sleeping dogs aren't gonna lie just yet. 
And it was in for your wife to set up and support you and your daughter to see what you're doing. She's 15 years old now. You guys grew up together. She was yeah. how how old you were when you had her and how old she is now. You know, like oh, the fact you did that alone, dude. It's cr- your 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 story. It's insane that you, I I don't know how you would have navigated those waters at 20 years old of just a single father and and all of that. Yeah. It was, it, it was tough, man, you know, and, 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 and just kind of go back and touch base with a little bit of that. There were some things in our, in our first conversation too, that I kind of left out for, for trepidation on like, you know, other people listening, but, you know, it was, it was tough, man. Um, you know, um, my daughter's mother, just, you know, it was tough on her. She wasn't nice. She was 19, 20. And she's like, I just can't do this anymore. She left us and it was tough. And, you know, um, I didn't have a great family dynamic either. Uh, when my dad came out of prison, you know, um, he got physical with my mom. And I said, you know, that's just not going to happen on my fucking watch. So we got into a physical to- uh, physical altercation. And so that just created massive friction. So my mom moved out. Then my dad kicked me out <laughs> with the baby. And then my baby's mother left. So I said, holy shit, what can happen next? <laughs> you know? And then my younger brother, um, you know, um, I come from a very traditional uh, uh, Spanish household. And my younger brother came out as uh, homosexual. So he actually, my dad, kicked him out on the street. And of course, I'm not going to let my younger brother not have a place to stay. So I was 21. <laughs> just came back from the electric training center, living my dream to having a kid, living on my own, having my kid and my kid brother live with me. <laughs> Dude, it's crazy. It's funny now, but at that time, man, it was the hardest thing I had ever, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy because you know, I'm at the height of what I thought was the best opportunity that a poor kid from San Mateo, Florida would ever get to throwing it the fuck away to working construction and just barely making it, dude. And having all this like life stuff thrust upon me. And I don't know how I do it. <laughs> I just don't know. If someone asked me, like, how do you do it? I have no idea. And I think that you have no idea as a person what you're capable of doing until you have no other option but to do it. Mm. You know, my brother, my brother is six years younger than me. So at that time, he was 14. And so I had to buy my brother's full clothes and, you know, be there for him, protect her for him. Obviously, a big ordeal coming out um and his personal kind of development and that and getting kicked out of his childhood home because he did come out and now having to live with his broke other older brother who also had a little baby to take care of um so yeah that was really tough it's weird thinking about it and speaking about it out loud but it's a really tough time dude and um now that i'm on the other side of that obviously i I think that no matter what happens to me now in my adult life, and having had gone through that at such a young age, um, nothing really phases me. It's, it's not as hard as that was. You know what I mean? Uh, the, 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 the thing that, like, the hardest part is, like, when you think about, like, your parents, people think, like, the unconditional love aspect of it. Like, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, I got you. And that's the hardest part is to hear that abandonment where it is for sure. And for you, somehow it became the opposite where you were like, I will not abandon. I, you took your brother in You're I, I can't imagine, you know, the mother leaving your daughter and you're like, I will work twice as hard. Don't worry. I will. I don't know how I'm gonna take my brother in. I can. I. I. I don't know how this is gonna work. But you just kept taking people in, 
and became you just stepped up in a way that is unfair to you but and you put everything aside for it and conceivably on the surface this never would have returned which makes your second run that much more admirable in for you to say things like i i win this time this time this time i win the worlds and it's on my son's birthday etc but you're i don't know man you were built so so different and so strong on so many different ways i it's hard to articulate but your background story i i, I, I don't even that, know man. i appreciate that you know it's 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 so surreal talk, talking about these things because, like, whenever we got off our last podcast, I almost sat down by myself for, like, 20 minutes. And just, like, I felt like I was telling someone else's story because I had kind of closed my mind to those days. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, brother, when I tell you that I skipped meals so my daughter could have food, I skipped meals so she could eat. Um, so I know what it's like not to have five fucking dollars in your in your in your checking account for a gallon of milk and having to 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 borrow money and having to do all these things and just kind of really, really, really struggle. And I think that while it was a really, really hard time in my life, I am grateful for it because I came on the other side with such a hustle and drive to just never be in that position again ever. Um, that if my younger self could see my older self now, I think I wouldn't believe that I'm at where I'm at, you know, financially and stable and, you know, look at the house that I live in now versus the single wide trailer with no AC and heat that I grew up in. Um, so it's just, it's, it's pretty fucking cool, but in, 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 and I'm very appreciative of those hard days because while they were insanely difficult. Um, they really shaped me into the man that I am now. I had to immediately grow up very quick. Um, and I'm very grateful that I did go through that period in time and years of struggle because it really just made me who I am today. And I don't think I would be the man that I am today if it wasn't for those experiences. I had to, I had to fight through because I didn't have anyone else to rely on. My brother Mark didn't have anyone else to rely on. I did my daughter. So it was, it was, it wasn't make it or break it. It was make it and don't break. You know what I'm saying? It, there was no option of breaking. You had yeah, dependence. 100%. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, you had dependence. You what, what your daughter must look at you now as? I can't even imagine how she sees you as a man and all you did for her. I can't even imagine how your daughter must the pride she must have when you do what you do and she sees you on the stream and she hears the story of the sacrifice. She's old enough now to listen to these podcasts and actually hear the story. I'm like, my God, my dad, what my dad did for me, you know, she, you are her Superman. You know, I, you know um, <laughs> as a father, you know, you never look for your children to be grateful to you for anything. At least I don't as a father, you know, that can be an ugly place to be in you know, because your kids don't owe you anything. You owe them everything. Period. You know what I'm saying? You would say, oh, well, like you said, you know, like, you know, you, know, you should be proud of it. But the thing is, like, I owed her that. She didn't, she doesn't never owe me anything. You see what I'm saying? So, like, for me, my my mindset on fatherhood was that's the shit that I needed to get done anyways. I don't need an applause or admiration or anything for that. That was my responsibility to, to do. And, like, if she feels those feelings one day when she's older, um, that's great, but she, Jocelyn doesn't owe me anything, any thanks or anything like that, because that was, those, it wasn't a burden, it just shit that I had to get done, and as her father, and as, as a man, those are things that were expected of me to get done, so, um, I hope that she thinks the world of me, it's difficult to kind of get what a 15-year-old girl is kind of thinking of her father, um, so, um, and, and it probably won't be till she has kids of her own and makes those sacrifices all for her to fully grasp. But at this time, like you know, of her uh, adolescence, I don't, I don't expect her to to think those things. It's just I need to do them and they need to get done. You know what I mean? That makes Dude, sense. I, uh, it, it, fuck me. 
I, I like hold you in such high regard. It's insane. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate were it. You, a lot were of you even, don't know my stories. Were you would even say, like, I don't need her gratefulness. That's what I have to do. It's yeah. like, it's true, though, but it's like, damn, man. Hey, how did you, uh, like, with how you, your story and how your story unfolded for you to be like this is, it's remarkable, man. You know, life has humbled me a lot, Ryan. You know, not only being born or, yeah, being super short. So, life has not been easy on that side of the spectrum. But my life has been far from easy, far from, you know, uh, tush. But again, like I said earlier, I'm super grateful for that. You know what I mean? Uh, because it made me being in the position I'm in now with my life so much more sweeter. You know, I would have never in a million years imagined owning the home that I own. I press, actually, I only need to, I can just tell Google to adjust my thermostat for me. And I, I did not have AC in the home growing up as a kid in Florida. We didn't have heat in the winter time. We had the oven that we would open the oven, and that's how we would have heat. Um, so it just made where I'm at in my life just so much more meaningful. And I don't take a day for granted, you know, being with the woman I'm with, your kids' health, and all the material shit that comes with, you know, being successful financially. It just makes that just so much more enjoyable to me. And yeah, just I'm just so much more appreciative of everything that I have. I don't take a day and stop for granted. It, it's like um, the ultimate underdog story where where people, if ever you're going to get tested by anything in life, you like everything you just said. You're like, listen, my friend, I I was born, I'm under five feet tall. I had a child that I had to raise by myself. My father and me had an altercation. I was kicked out. My brother got kicked out, had to take him on. I was, I've, do you understand what I've been through? We were poor. We, we had, we didn't have a, we couldn't afford a home. We couldn't afford heat. I couldn't afford any of these things. And you think that the nominations on the worlds are going to intimidate me? Or you think nice. I'm going to be overwhelmed by Sheffield? I didn't get overwhelmed in the darkest of hours, my friend. And in the uncertainty I felt in those moments. And um, mm -hmm. Jonathan, you I make... Mean, it's a great way to put it. That's you a, make that's it absolutely all, a fantastic way to put it, bro. You make it all the way to Worlds, and you win Worlds, Jonathan, they can make movies about this storyline. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of an underdog who... You had... I don't know how you made it this far. With success, with everything. God bless, man. And you deserve everything you've got for everything you've done. You. Like, I'm so man. happy, you know, like, you met your wife, have a kid, the whole nine, and you're, like, in a good place. Um, I appreciate that, man. Um, I mean, you know, um, I just, something that I'll share with you, um, I won't say who said it or whatever, that's private, but um, after our last um, podcast, I had a couple of DMs. I had a lot of DMs, but one DM that really stuck with me, um, you know, that a, a person out there that w was seriously, I mean, they, they told me that they were contemplating, you know, ending it all. They were going through so much and, you know, the gym was their solace. Um, but it had been seeming like it had not been enough to keep their demons at bay. And he said, uh, uh, they listened to my story on King of the Lifts. And they had said, how dare I think of those things when this guy's been through so much worse and came out the other side. Um, and sometimes I'll scroll back and I'll look at that message. Um, and I feel empowered by it. I feel motivated by it. I say, I'm at a point now in my professional career of, uh, of lifting that it's not just for me now. And it's just not for my family now. It's for the guys in the background who are going to do stuff. And if I need to be what I need to be for them, 
then it's my duty to do that. Does that make any sense? Um, and me and this person have been in communication off and on. And um, I just know that I'm not just doing it for me now. I'm doing it for what I represent and for the underdogs and for cats that are going through some shit and they need an example that you can come out of some serious nasty shit and still be on top as long as you keep your head on straight and you work hard. I am. Um, I I ran into a guy who, at one of the one of the championships, I was just recently commentating, and um, you know, you you meet people, you take pictures, people listen to the podcast, and that's great. And he said, he goes, "Listen, Ryan, you saved my life. And, you know, the podcast saved my life," is what he said. And I mm-hmm. I thought just I didn't. I, I kind of smiled. I was like, "Oh, he's just saying it. Like, oh, it's it's what you say that if you really love some, you know." whatever a video game movie mm-hmm. so I'm like wow and he's yeah. like no i'm being serious um he told me is he told me when you had leah bavlon and she was taught he said his whole life he was off different and literally at the point of suicide when he put on a podcast and leah bavlon described her entire life autistic not knowing she was autistic and I mean, from outbursts to, you know, you just, why am I this way? And literally Mm -hmm. she thought, and her family thought, it's just you, there's something wrong with you. So she she was literally on the verge of suicide. And then when she finally found out she was autistic, now it can make sense. And she could start coping and finding, you know, diving into that and getting help. Mm -hmm. And he was on the verge. When he heard that podcast, he said, Oh my God, now I know I'm autistic. Everything she had mentioned, and it literally saved his life. When you talk wow. about sharing wow. your story, it's, it, I mean, it's crazy like to see this guy face to face and him tell you that. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, that's, especially face to face, too. You know, that's, that's wild, you know? And wow. to say like your story, when you come on here, if you, if you have the strength and fortitude to share your story like you did, um, cause your story is, is one of the most riveting I've ever heard and heroic to be where you're at now in life. Um, at this stage in your life, there's no question somebody's listening and they're like, this is exactly what I got to hear exactly when I got to hear it. And, and Jonathan, yeah. the more you win, the more people are going to hear it and the more strength you, you, you give back from yeah. If you win Worlds, you go to Sheffield, you go to World Games, and that all springs off of one performance at Worlds. That all comes from Worlds, your son's birthday, Mm -hmm. which couldn't be more poetic that on your son's birthday, that Mm -hmm. one day will open up the possibility of telling your story on platforms like Sheffield, World Games, and everything that's going to be involved with those, the platforms are huge and the difference you can make on a much bigger scope. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it's my duty to get there so more people can hear it. You know, it's tough going through it, but it's opening up. It was tough to open up, you know? Like I said, I sat in the room for 30 minutes by myself. Like, it just, like, you're really thinking about everything because it really felt like I was telling another person's, like, life. Because it just it happened so long ago when I built wall from then and there you know as as most men do force field around us so it doesn't it doesn't uh can't penetrate and hurt hurt our hearts the, those those emotions um but i feel obligated to push to the point where more people can can maybe be impacted by that because i think it's important to when um to share those experiences, you know, of when 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 life does throw thing after thing after thing, and you can still come out the other side positive, you know what I'm saying? Um, I think it's important to share that. Like my life could have ended up a million different ways, you know. Mm. When I was a kid, I thought that I was going to sell drugs as an adult because my dad and my uncles—that's all they did. I, that's what I saw those men doing, and I said, okay, well, that's that's what we do, right? So, you know, uh, when they came and arrested my dad, um, I was 11, 
yeah, I was 11 and I saw the SWAT team come and, you know, punch my mom in the face and throw her on the floor and pulled me to gunpoint, you know, I was 11 years old. But I was always like a little stocky. So, you know, I had literally had a police officer boot on my chest, shotgun to my face at 11 years old when they came and raided my dad's house. Um, so when that happened, you know, I said, okay, wow, then no, that's, that's not where we're going. That, that, that could, that could never be us. And that was extremely traumatizing for me and my family. And, um, I never would want my family to ever experience something like that. So, you know, I said that I will never fuck with that. That's not something that I'm going to do. I'm going to earn my living the right way, you know, because my dad sold drugs my entire life. So that's just what I thought that we did. You know what I'm saying? It was so normal to me. But, you know, um, and I'm not saying anything bad about my father, you know, and the choices he made are his own and that's his cross to bear. But that's just growing up in that element. I thought that that's what we did. And that's what I thought 100%. That's what I was going to do when I became aware. Um, but, you know, everything happens for a reason. When they came and raided the house, you know, that for me, I just was like, as a kid being like, I will never put my loved ones through this. And, you know, I decided never to even fuck with that kind of stuff. You know, and I never have and I never will. And I said, okay, well, that's definitely the way you don't make money. I would much rather bust my ass and barely make my bills than have that easy way out and put my family and loved ones through that. Or God forbid, put they put me in a fucking cage for 12 years. You know what I mean? Um, so again, everything happens for a reason. You have to learn from those mistakes. And whether you learn from your own or other people's mistakes, you just got to always choose to be better. That's and you're, You didn't see your dad again until he got out later in life when you were an adult? Yeah, my dad didn't get out until I got started graduating. I started graduating high school and came back from the Olympic Training Center. I was going at the Olympic Training Center with my dad and my dad got out, which is a big reason why I came back home. And then stuff happened and just kind of broke up the family, unfortunately. Well, or who knows? Fortunately or fortunately. But yeah, so yeah, he, I didn't see him until after uh, I came back from the Olympic Training Center. So. The sacrifice you've made over the years. Who would have ever thought that guy would be here right now? And you know, I, I never thought that. I never thought, you know, I mean, I know I touched this last on my last, you know, kind of thing, but when I came back from the Olympic Training Center and I just, I went through a long period of just really like, just like looking in the mirror of myself. I'm just going to be like, how the fuck did you fuck that up? You fucking idiot. I went through some really bad mental space. But I had to just suck that shit up because I had Jocelyn and I had my brother Mark and they needed me to make that fucking rent. I I had no time to wallow in my own self-pity. I had to pay these fucking bills and make sure we had food on the fucking table. There was no time for me to wall around in self-pity and woe is me and I'll never be on the platform again and I'll never win another championship again and you know going through that own depression because I did that's what it was I was I was going through severe depression but I had to man the fuck up and deal with my shit in a different manner because we still needed to get on with our lives and Again, everything happens for a reason, and um, I'd like to believe that at least. And um, we just we made it through that period, and I got into powerlifting, like we discussed in our last chat, the most serendipitous way. And I have fought and fought and fought my way all the way up to where I am now. And I am proud of myself, but I don't want to pat myself on the back too much because there's still work to be done. We 100% are going to win worlds. And there's certain numbers that I know that I'm capable of that are my goals to hit. So if we do decide that this is our last run, um, I know I'll put it all out there. And I want to have a showing of the 66 
that has never been done before beyond what I did in Reno to where when they talk about a 66, they have to mention me. I have to come up in the conversation. And when they talk about some of the best power lifters ever, I want my name to come up in the conversation. And I'm not talking about pound for pound because we can get on this into the semantics of that. I'm just talking about the, one of the best power lifters ever. I want my name to be in the conversation. Not the best power lifter, but I need to be in the conversation. That's my personal goal. That's the legacy that I want to leave behind. So when my son comes of age and if he just does decide to do this, that will be a legacy that he can be proud of to be from. Does that make sense? I can tell you, right. So I've been doing this. I've been in powerless things since 2008. I've been commentating and doing King of List since 2016. And I mean this. If I live to be 100, I will never forget you. I will never forget you. And I will never forget, like, I still think about, you know, where you come from. And I take inspiration from it. Like, it's crazy. You know? I I can appreciate that, man. It means a lot. I appreciate that more than you know. Everything you've done, everything you've done, and and you win a world title, and you and everything that happens after you win the world title now more than ever, so many doors open up immediately afterwards. Oh, guess what? Now it's Sheffield. Guess what? Now it's World Games. What that one single win opens up so much more. Your legacy is you. You literally are on the pathway to building a legacy in one final swoop that mm-hmm. you you can achieve everything you want to achieve. You can mm-hmm. do everything you want to do and you can make all the impact you want to make. And it's on mm-hmm. CBS. It's on Eurosport. It's on the Olympic YouTube and Olympic channel. It's at Sheffield. Everything happens coming down to Lithuania. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you could hang your hat. And from here on out, it's a beacon of light for those people who need it. And, and yeah. it's uh my man, your son, can you imagine him checking all this out later on in the future? Yeah. Like that's that's my dad. Yeah. That's my yeah. dad. You yeah. you he will talk about you completely different than you and your brother talk about your dad. He will talk about you like with pride, chest out. This is where I come from. He would never mm. in his life turn his back on me. He will fall to pieces. Before he lets us down, he will go without food before we go without food. He will stay up at night and work so that we could sleep. That's my dad. Mm-hmm. You I know? appreciate that, man. I appreciate and, that uh, you know, a lot. Thank you. I, I, that, that means a lot to hear, to hear that coming back, man. You know, when you, when you become a father, there's, especially to a little boy, um, you feel, at least for me, an overwhelming sense to leave something behind for him. You know, me and my father, you know, we are, you know, our past is our past. And he was a perfect example of what I didn't want to become. Right. So that's, that's how, you know, every, every, every son collects father figures and every son uses his father as an example whether it be for good or for bad, right? So for me, okay, my dad is the example of everything he's not with me. You know, and no hard feelings to him. And we, we have a much better relationship now. But my whole life, I was like, okay, the opposite of that, right? So when Jace was born, I just, I felt even more so than with my daughter, just an overall my sense of duty to leave something behind for him. And, you know, and you really start to think of maybe not only like your mortality, but, you know, what happens if I'm not here for him? You know what I mean? Um, How will he remember me? How will he have things to think back on? And I think that this year's run for me, if something were to happen, um, will be my last gift for him to be like, wow, daddy did that. You know what I mean? And um, 
And that's the legacy that I want to live, leave for him is setback after setback after setback. Um, we were able to not only get over it, but climb on top of the mountain and be the undisputed best of the best. And um, that's my legacy that I want to leave behind, not only for my son, but for the world of powerlifting is no matter how many times you get knocked down, get the fuck up and try it again. A, a winner is a loser who tried one more time. That's what a winner is. Because God knows I've lost way more competitions than what I've won. But we are going to win in such a spectacular fashion at Worlds that I will be the undisputed best 66 there has ever been. And maybe ever will be going forward, at least for some time. So maybe my son picks up the mantle, but we'll see. So, like I said, that, that's my legacy. If anyone takes anything out, out of my career in powerlifting, it's that motherfucker didn't give up, did he? But think about no this. matter what happened. Think about when people complain about their scenarios. For a guy like you, be like, are you telling me you started off with less than me? Tell yeah. me you started off with less than me. Very where did true. you start? You, 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 you could look at somebody big. Like, where did you start with? What, what did you what did you start with, my friend? I'm an athlete. I stand under five feet. I was in a trailer with no heat. My father abandoned me and my brother. <laughs> I had a yeah. daughter of my own. What did you start? Tell me your story with what you yeah. started off with. And I and we became... all have our trials and tribulations. So I I would hate for someone to think like, oh, my my woe is aren't as important. That you know never enough. But, but at the same time, for, for inspiration wise, yeah. dog, I, I shit you not. I think about stuff like this, where it's like, <laughs> pull yourself together, kid. You got yeah. you, you if Jonathan could deal with what he deal with in no, you know, in a world of like where victimization is herohood, you're like, Ugh. no, you're like, no, no, no. Yes. I will make myself the hero through accomplishment. You yes. know, I'm going to do this in spite of. Um, yes. And you got stronger be because of, and it's, uh, I don't know, man, it's it's nothing short of inspirational. And, and you, I, there's <laughs> nobody who's going to hear this and hear your story and you win worlds, holy smokes, man! Um, yeah, it's it's just a remarkable story. And uh, thank you, bro. Yeah, man. I, something something I read somewhere once, and I, I can't recall, but it really really stuck with me was be the hero of your own story. It, and for me, that was so impactful for me because it is like you said, victimization. You know, oh, what was me? What was me? What was me? You deserve, and this is to anyone out there going through some shit right now. I'm talking directly to you. A powerlifting bullshit all aside. You can be the hero of your own story. You deserve love, and you are worthy of love, and you are worthy of all your accomplishments that you want to achieve. And just believe in yourself. I know shit is, can be hard, and I know you're going through some shit that no one else knows but you. But I want you to know that the universe wants you to succeed. But the only thing in your way is yourself. And you have to learn to love yourself regardless of your circumstances. And just remember, the universe wants you to win. The universe wants you to succeed. It's just you have to believe that you are worthy of those things. And you have to believe in yourself. No matter what happens, always bet on yourself and always go like for what you want. Don't let all the noise on the side keep you from achieving what the universe wants you to achieve. And you can do it. Just don't ever give up on yourself. Ever. No matter what happens, do not ever quit on you. And you will eventually get there. I promise you. I promise you. Hearing you say that, do you think, and this happens often, 
you became the man that you needed when you were young? Absolutely. A hundred percent. And what you 100%. just said, you would have told yourself when you were young. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. You know, but, you know, we, sometimes that that's, that's the burden that falls on someone strong is to be strong all the time. And I think that the honor of being a strong person, and I'm not talking about physical, I'm talking about what matters, strength that matters in the heart. The burden of being someone strong is, or the duty of being someone strong is you have to be strong for other people. Because while others may falter and stumble, a strong person doesn't put somebody down or like ever put themselves above them. A strong person helps people up always. You know what I'm saying? And I look at myself, you know, whether I'm someone's favorite power lifter or not, I don't, I don't care. But if someone can draw inspiration from sharing my story, and as difficult as talking about some of this stuff is, um, I think it's important because, you know, who knows what can grasp or who can grasp inspiration from this. I mean, like I said, that was only one of several um, messages I got that, People were like, that helped me in ways that I didn't think I needed help. And that helped me in ways that I didn't think I could get that help. And your story, thank you so much for sharing it. Thank you for being who you are. Um, and for me, while being world champion and all these things, those are my goals. But I think deep down, I want to be like a people's champion. And I want people to be like, you know, if they follow my story, be like, wow, if he did that and made it to that level, then maybe I can do what I want to do. Maybe I can go to art school. Maybe I can, um, you know, get that job or get that promotion or, or or obtain that lifestyle that I really think I can I can do it. Does that make sense? Oh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. That's, we, that's, we... I want to be the people's champion. I don't want to be just the world champion, you know, give me my medal and deuces. You know, I want, I want to stick around in people's hearts because at the end of the day, when we leave this earth, the only thing left is the impact we made on people, right? Because that lives forever, I think, at least. Well, the, the biggest thing that separates us from, from like any other animal that walks the earth is that we take inspiration from each other. I don't know how Very another true. animal inspires another. We take inspiration from each other. You can be inspired by somebody you never met, and it could change your life. That's American. what separates us. The number if someone ever said, What separates you from, from any, any animal walking the earth? It's that. It's our ability to push each other forward and inspire each other. Absolutely. That's your, that's and, your you know, special ability. If you can't, if you use it if you can. Yeah. Absolutely. And also to just being aware of our own mortality. You know, life is only beautiful because we know that it one day it will end. And that's the beauty of life is knowing that it will end one day. So you have to love your love. You have to love your loved ones hard because who knows what life happens and may take them away. And you have to love the things you do with all the passion that your heart can muster because something can happen in a blink of an eye. I can have an accident squatting over 600 pounds and never squat again. So I love powerlifting. It is not an avenue for me. It is the only street I'm on. So I respect and I'm so grateful that I'm able to do powerlifting at the capacity now that I'm able to do it and be at these competitions and be on these national and world stages. And I will never take that for granted. It's such a blessing after everything I've been through to have one final opportunity. And for me, every meet, whether I decide to lift in Sheffield or, or, or a World Games or maybe even at beyond that, every single meet in my heart feels like my last meet because it very well may be. And I treat it as such and I love it as such and I respect it as such. And I think in that lies my superpower in knowing that this may be my last meet. So let's have as much fun as we can at it. Because several meets ago, years ago, I thought that my last meet was my last meet. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So 
it's uh yeah i just and i love the sport i love the community you know um been in it for a while and um i wouldn't rather be doing any other sport it's it's funny because sometimes when i talk to younger people new to the certain levels of the sport they're attaining they ask me if being in the game this long it still feels the same and i tell them kind of what you just said where I actually appreciate it more and more because the more you go on in life, you know, life take eventually will take everything from you. Nothing you have in life will not be taken from you. Everyone you've ever met, your job, everything, you're not, you don't leave with anything. It's Mm -hmm. finite. It's finite, but that's what makes everything beautiful. Every single moment. And Mm -hmm. when you're young. The flower is not beautiful because it lasts forever. That's right. That's right. And, 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 um, and it doesn't matter whatever happens to Lithuania, you go back to Lithuania a year, it's not going to be the same as when you go to Lithuania this summer. Lithuania will never be Lithuania again, like it will be on the day of your son's birthday. That's a special day. and It'll never be replicated. And when you get older, you know, these things when you're younger and it's all in front of you, you have the illusion and it's only an illusion that well, I got so much time and you're yeah. almost experiencing things knowing I'll be back next year though. Huh? And I, I well, yeah. I'll have this again, not knowing you might not have this again. I, I, um, mm-hmm. there's a Very junior true. lifter. Oh, with, such a good way. Such a good way to play it. Bro. It, such it, a good way to play it. And, um, I, there's a junior lifter who posted from France that she's not going to go to worlds for the open world. She's going to, bulk up a weight class and focus on that. And I hit her up in the DMs because I met her at Junior Worlds before and I'm like, think about this. Uh, you may never go back again. That might mm-hmm. have been it. That might have been it. Yeah. I In the yeah. end, you got to be comfortable with your decision. Do whatever you want to do. I support it. But yeah. when you get older, you know. Yeah. These, you know, that's a young person's mentality. But the older you get, you know, like, I'm telling you, it's an illusion. It's, yeah, it's, no, you're... it's finite. And yep. for you in this situation, you know, like your appreciation when you show up a world, is like, I'm taking this all in. I'm taking mm-hmm. this all in. Oh this my God, never happen really. again. The immense, I, I describe it to people because the, they'll never understand unless you do it. Um, the immense pride that I feel wearing the USA across my chest and representing not only myself and my family, but my entire country. Undescribable. Un- undescribable. It's a whole different feeling of just pride and, and just knowing that you're representing not only yourself and your family, but your entire country. And I'm, re- I'm wearing the red, white, and blue. And every time I've worn that singlet, um, it's just been a magical performance because I know that I owe it to myself and my entire country, which I absolutely love, um, to perform and to represent us in the best way possible. So um, unless you put on that uniform, and go out there and, and, and do those things, you'll never know. And for someone to not take that serious or not grasp at every opportunity to do so is wild to me. It's wild. I couldn't, I couldn't. It's like, say yes, go. Nothing, mm-hmm. nothing is for certain. Mm-hmm. Jesse Norris was 23 years old and the greatest powerlifter in the world when his career got cut short through injuries on his back. And oh, wow. he will he will never be back again at 23. He's fine. He can operate in his life, but he can't compete. Like to your point yeah. about your back, you don't know when it gives and you'll be okay, but you can't squat and lift like you do. You, you'll, mm-hmm. you'll squat, you'll always lift, but can yeah, you do it, it to yeah. an extent of being a national champion to make it past mm-hmm. the murderers or of, of contenders? Maybe, maybe mm-hmm. not. That's why you're just like, I tell everybody, Say yes, go and experience yeah. that moment. I yeah. promise you, yeah. you'll never regret it. Yeah. 
you know, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things too, like, um, but you don't know as a young lifter, but like as a veteran, because I would feel like every, every battle that I've, every, every meet that I've been has kind of been like a battle, you know, it's not like a clear cut win. Obviously I had the, uh, 2022 nationals where Manzo didn't have his best days. So it was kind of like a, you know, like, you know, I wouldn't say easy because no disrespect to any lifter, but you know what I mean? He didn't have his best days. So it was just me versus him. That was a battle that everybody was thinking. And, you know, he underperformed and I just performed. So what I'm going with that was that like now at this stage, I'm a veteran. Like when you said earlier, like you don't watch people's stuff. You don't know because I'm a veteran, bro. I know that that shit is just noise and it's going to be distracting to my end goal because what I, what, what I can do is what I can do. And that just comes with being prepared to be in that battle. You know, I knew that nationals wasn't going to be a layup. I mean, fuck, we had a bunch of talent. If I had fucked up and slipped, somebody could have taken it. Charlie could have taken it. Uh, I was the young kid with the blonde hair. I forgot his name. Austin. Uh, huh? Austin could have took it. I mean, who knows? Manzo put together a good day. Maybe he could have taken it. Uh, Clement, maybe he could have took it. You know, or, 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 Brandon Lee, or Brian Lee, maybe he could have taken it. So for me, I'm like, okay, I focus on what I can. And I think that just comes with, again, being a veteran and knowing that I have to just rely on what I know I can do and have the best day I can and then the chips fall into me. How hard was it to watch Charlie come out for the final deadlift, knowing this was the, the bump you off the U.S. spot, knowing everything – by this time, you knew it was on your son's birthday, the whole night, and you're watching. It's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know Lithuania. I was gonna lift on Jason's birthday. I didn't oh, know okay, that okay. Like three days ago, dude. So I'm they so released glad it we, in the in the chat. I'm so glad we waited for this podcast for today. That I, I didn't know. I didn't. I, I had no idea. Um, I knew Worlds was gonna be in Lithuania sometime in June. I was hoping late June, so I wouldn't miss his first birthday. But that's neither here nor there. But yeah, this was just the other day when they put it in the 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 world's group chat on Instagram. Um, but to answer your question, um, I you know if I if I can be frank, I said, and I'm gonna say this, I said if that motherfucker breaks the world record I just set to beat me, he deserves to go. Swear to God, I said. Fair enough, and that's a good because, way of looking I mean, at things, right? Yeah, I said, I said, I said, this weight class is so competitive. I had to literally break the world record total. <laughs> to secure the W. If this son of a bitch pulls that fucking miraculous deadlift out of his ass, he deserves to fucking hat, hat straight hat. up. Exactly what I told Arian. Because Arian, I told Arian, load the deadlift up. Load it up. Do what I know I can do. I'm telling Arian I'm gonna get it. He says, no. Jay, if you do this lift, he goes, on, on your second, you match the world record, Jay. If on your third you get it, you will break the world record, okay? If he pulls what he needs to pull, there's nothing we can do. And I said, because I'm stubborn. I said, okay, fuck it. I will trust in you, Aaron. Let's go to the 280, 275? The, the, the 585, I think. Sorry, I'm, I'm American. I don't, I don't know what kilos. <laughs> yeah, it's 260, um, 265 kilos. Yeah, that's 585. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I told Arian, I said, you know, I said, I said load that some bitch up. Let's make, let's do the potential I know I can do. And he said, we don't need that right now. Trust me. But again, back to the beginning of the conversation, that's the trust that the lifter has to have with this coach and him. Right. To know, hey, he is not going to put me in a position where I can't win. And obviously, Arian being Arian, he's like the Pokédex of powerlifters. He's like, this guy will have to pull, what was it, 11, 10, 11 kilos more than he's ever done before. So let's secure, let's make that third lift, break the world record. And if he breaks the world record by that much to beat you, then it is what it is. And I said, and this conversation is happening within a span of 30 seconds. I'm right. Like, Fair enough. Load yeah. the fucking weight on. Let, let's go ahead and just, let's go for a nine for nine days. And I don't know if you notice, <laughs> it's kind of weird because I'm holding like a smell saw in my mouth. 
I'm kind of smiling as I'm chalking up an SBD kind of caught like a little moment on the little real video. Where I'm kind of smiling. Um, it's like a really cheeky smile because it, I've never felt this uh, at a competition before, but I had this feeling come over me like I had already won. Really? Like, it's, it's so really? Weird. Oh my God, it's such a surreal, it was like a blanket of confidence. If you gotta understand, I was fucking hurting, dude. I literally had Arian set a timer every two hours, ibuprofen and Tylenol, ibuprofen and Tylenol throughout the entire competition. So, but when he loaded that weight and I'm chalking up and I'm, you know, doing my thing, I'm just listening, I'm, 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 I'm having that conversation with myself and I'm feeling, because, you know, I'm a very emotional lifter, you know, when I go out there, there's no fear, no pain, I'm just, I'm in the moment, there's a whirlwind, there's a storm brewing in my heart and my belly and my chest. And I'm such an emotional lifter. I think everybody can see that when I go on stage. You know, I'm owning the moment. I'm owning the crowd. I'm pulling energy from them. And it's such a weird feeling in that moment, seconds before the bar is loaded. I knew I had already won the competition. And it was just such a weird thing going out there. And one thing I always feel like, okay, every lifter carries an emotion. Right? I mean, we're emotional creatures, right? Uh, people. So, but here's the thing that a lot of athletes and, and, and the top guys will tell you, you get to choose what emotion you carry. We all carry an emotion going onto the platform, whether it's fear, whether it's uncertainty, whether it's cockiness, whether it's whatever. Why not choose to feel invincible? Right? So in that moment, I chose to feel invincible. And it's such a weird feeling, bro. It just hit. And I was like, oh, we got this. Whatever was on that bar, I was going to get. And there was no ifs or ands or buts about it. And I made that third deadlift look like an opener. And very well could have been an opener. But I'll leave that out for another time. But it just, man, we hit it, smashed it. So easy. So hyped. And... Yeah, I had to finish my day before everyone else and kind of just sit back there and see where the deadlifts fell. But I wasn't worried. Like it was, took off my belt. I didn't feel like that moment. Oh, maybe, maybe I should have gone, you know, 615, 620 or whatever, you know, or, or higher or lower. It's your second guess. But I said, I'm fine with it. I was yeah. such at peace. I said, I'm fine with that. Leave that shit there. I left what I needed to do on the platform. Let it be with me. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. It's, it, was, it, was, it was a moment, dude. It was, it, was, it was one of the coolest feelings I've ever felt in a competition. Before. It, it is something to be at peace with it. With a lot of things mm-hmm. in life, that's what you want. Just let me be at mm-hmm. peace with my decision. Just let mm-hmm. me be, however this goes, as long as I can walk away without regrets and at peace with it, I'm okay. I'm okay. Mm-hmm. I thought I wanted this. I thought I wanted that. But if I could put forth my best foot and it's like, okay, we're good right there. And it's cool that you could take off your belt, sit back knowing my day is over and other people are taking swings at my goal. Yeah. And, um, and you were still even then like, no, nah, we're okay. We're going to be yeah. okay. I mean, we, we led the whole meet, you know, we led the whole meet and not to talk about other podcasts, but that's why I always, you know, King of the List for me is if I ever do a podcast, it'll be just be King of the List because, you know, you do your research. You know, I heard snippets of podcasts on the, on the boards on, on, on the way home. And forget Jonathan, you know what I'm saying? And it took me back a little bit, but I'm like, this is why I don't follow the lifting because it gets in your head, right? So, uh, I mean, there was one specific podcast that was like one of the people were like, Jonathan's not even posting what he's doing. And I'm like, it took me back a little bit because I'm like, I've been the most transparent I've been leading into this competition. And uh, to the point where I posted my body weight, which I never do, uh, just because I just feel like I, I know everybody cuts a lot, so it's like I don't want them to know how close to body weight you know, it's kind of keep them guessing. But um, where I was going with that was, was so many people were just like overlooking me. And 
something that I think it's Matt Gary, right? Am I right. saying his name right? Matt. Something that he said, he literally said exactly what I did was going to happen, but not on me. He's like, it, it was so, it was so, it, it, it made me smile when I heard it because he was like, the person who wins, no one's going to do this crazy 740, 730 toll. That's outrageous. The person who wins is going to go nine for nine, make all his lifts, and probably end somewhere between 710 to 715. Literally said that exact same fucking thing on wow. a podcast. And it made me laugh. It made me smile ear to ear because I'm like, that is exactly how it happened. And it's so funny to me um, <laughs> that when I see him, I got to tell him in person how funny, the, how funny I thought that was. Because he was like, yeah, these everybody hyping the, oh, such and such can do a 730, a 740. No, that's not gonna happen. That's not. That's ridiculous to think that that's gonna happen. And literally, word for word, what he said the winner was gonna do, we did and execute. It was. It was. It was so funny to hear that him say that. You're a veteran. You've been around the block. You've been to nationals. You've been to worlds. You've been around. You know when people start quote unquote air air quotes here for anyone only listening doing the math. Were they? Take a lifter's best squat, best bench, best deadlift, put together and be like, this is where I think their total is going to be. That Ridiculous. so rarely happens. So rarely Ridiculous. is that the case. You've seen it a million times. You've experienced it firsthand. It's a unicorn. It's a unicorn. Yeah. That very rarely, you can't count. And some people count on like all five doing that. All five? One yeah. out of the five might. And only, yeah. and you go nine for nine, because you do moves like Arian did, stay in the pocket. You know, yes, you had more kilos, but you stay in the pocket to go nine for nine and clinch the win. It's And that's why it's good that Team USA has Matt Gary as the head coach. He's going to be your head coach. Because he's like Arian. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. I knew, I knew that. I knew that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's like Arian in that he knows how to win titles because he knows how – he doesn't believe in hype. He doesn't believe in he, – he'll look at all your gym lifts, but he's paying attention to what's happening on the day. And um, mm-hmm. if you want me to load yeah. up a big third squat, convince me with your first and second. You make it look better and better like you did at nationals. He'll be like, okay, your your second move better than your first. I believe you. But, mm-hmm. you know, you, you got to convince him because he's like, it's on me. It's on him. I'm pretending I'm him right now. But he's like, yeah, it's yeah, on yeah. me. It's on me to win USA 12 points or nine points or yeah, the yeah, title, yeah. a sweep. It all reflects on Matt Gary. And if you, if he drops the ball with attempt selection, you get roasted online these days. In a sports, mm-hmm. there's, sports fans are supposed oh, to. Oh, the coach coaches. is the first one to be hung. Oh, the coach oh, is yeah. always the first of one course. to be hung. It is. No it, that's right. Well, the coach gets fired before players. It's true. Yeah. It is what it is. It is what it is. And Matt Gary knows, and especially if you're Team USA, the hype on mm-hmm. USA is a sweep. Matt Gary's like, yeah, no, no pressure, huh? A sweep? So yeah. it's hey, uh Hey yeah. Ryan. Can you excuse me just for a quick moment? I'll be back lightning fast. You bet, you bet. Okay, I'm, I'm so sorry. Good. I'm so sorry. All right, we're back. We're back. Okay. But um I had so, to make yeah. a big, quick bottle. We, we, um, we're we're just talking about um handling and uh how Matt Gary and coaches and, and just in sports in general. And you know what? I love that powerlifting is getting to the point now where coaches like Matt Gary is considered the goat when it comes to game day coaching and handling because his attempt selection, his scouting report is phenomenal. His attempt selection is nine times out of 10 bang on. No one gets it right every time, but we're getting to the point like normal, like big time sports where we know who coaches are and we judge them. And we, you know, we scrutinize like sports fans do. And, And I've seen certain nations at the world championships, and I could tell – look, I'm going to be totally honest with you. Me and Matt Gary, as well as Adriana and Mike Gold, are going to do a recap of PA Nats tomorrow night. There was some there was some game day decisions by not Arian, obviously, but other coaches that were eyebrow-raising, that were – sometimes the person got away with it, and they per, their lifter won in spite of mistakes, attempt selection-wise – other peep times, the lifter 
did not perform. And if you go to the, sometimes you can get away with it because your lifter is just that talented. But if you go to the world championships, if you are not 100% correct, there are national teams, they literally, after the world championships, they have to report and explain if your lifter was nominated seventh and your lifter came in 10th, wow. how did you drop three nominations? How did you wow. get outplayed? If your lifter was supposed to podium, but they came off podium, how did you get outplayed? We want to report. Wow. Um, and they actually they actually do the stats. You came in with seven nominated podium finishes. You left with 10. You keep your job. But you wow. came in or the, or the opposite. That's super cool. It, it is very difficult at the world stage. It's not like certain nationals. Nationals, you have guys and girls who are amazing at programming, don't mm-hmm. know game day handling nearly as much. Yeah. And they get away with that at local levels and sometimes national levels. That shit will not fly at worlds. And yeah. Matt Gary, you guys are lucky. Matt Gary knows game day handling. He will not get outplayed. Or very rarely are you going to catch him lacking. Other yeah. nations, I have seen other nations come in with quality people. They're green, though. They're not used to it. And a guy like, like Matt Gary, if it's close, if it's you, Jonathan, someone else is neck and neck, Matt Gary will guide you through to the win. Just like just like Arian did with you. He'll be like, yeah. trust me, we're going to make him load without you overloading. You'll hit, he'll miss. Yeah. I know you have more, but you will hit and he will miss. You got to trust me. And they yeah. will guide you to the win. And and it's a beautiful way of alleviating stress when you know I'm in good hands. Because other nations don't have that, my friend. And they're going to look at their handlers like, he's got Matt Gary. He's got Arian. <laughs> and they're going to look at it like, if this is close, yeah, we're going to yeah. lose. Yeah. I, need to be, I need to be a lot stronger to be Jonathan. Because if it's close, I probably, we're not going to make the right decisions. And they will bully you. I, it, it, it's so cool that powerlifting has gotten to to where a lot of the handlers are are and, and coaches are being renowned because, and I and I've said this before and I'll say it again. You know the trust between a handler and lifter is extremely important. Their their relationship is extremely important because, like I am the tool, but your handler is 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 the worker. You know because yeah. I know I'm capable of X, Y, Z, but if we don't need that, and when you're a lifter in, you're in the shit, you're in the trenches, it's difficult to see the overall. And it's so important to have a good handler and coach because they see the goal and the path to the goal. All the lifter has to worry about is making that lift and executing. And if both parties do their job correctly, a, a, a W is inevitable. You know, so um, I'm excited to work with him. I've never like I've met him kind of passingly, but you know, um, he's to go. I don't, he's to go. He uh, put it this way: if shit hits the fan, if for some reason something veers off track, he's a guy also that would be. He's running the numbers, being like, "Are we now pulling for gold? Are we defending silver? Are we?" He knows all the because it's it's you're getting attacked by like the top five. It's not just one person and. Even if shit gets off track, for whatever reason, he's the guy who'll be in the pocket and be like, we're going to defend silver. Because if we pull for gold and miss, we're right off the podium. If you go off the podium, no world games. And as long as you're silver, probably you might still have Sheffield. You're in world games. Like, he, he, he's he got 60 seconds. He is a wor- he's got plan A, B, and C. Where it, it, and, you, you have to because it, – Yeah. And it – and even given day, anything can happen. You know, obviously a lifter is going to be like, okay, I'm going to have my perfect day. Nine for nine, let's ride. But nine for nine is such a rarity. I mean, I've never gone nine for nine before. And like I said, admittedly, we sandbagged a little bit. Was that the most weight I was capable of? Absolutely not. But that's all the weight that I needed on the day. And again, that's why having a good handler and a good overall picture and pathway to get there is so important. And um, Again, Arian, he's the fucking man, and he's my guy in the corner, and he always will be. Um, so I'm excited going I forward. I think the how much is oh, loyalty he, a thing for you? How much is like 100%. loyalty a thing for you? Even oh, dude, you know, some I'm people... Puerto Rican, loyalty is everything. 
I, I, some people bounce from, from coach to coach and you like, if they have a bad day, a bad meet or whatever, and you are like, no, nah, it's airy to the end. I, I got a guy. Yeah. You know, um, I've seen a lot of lifters do that and, and it, and, and it just makes me think like, how do you, how do you establish that trust? There's been a couple of times Aaron and I butt heads, you know, obviously we're literally just exact same age. Um, but, you know, his job is to secure me the W, period. And that's all he focuses on. And I just have to get to focus on the lifting. All the hard parts done. I don't have to worry about how to let uh, warm ups and, and how many lifters to, uh, to line up again. And oh, man, I don't worry about that. And I know a lot of guys do, and I just, I watch them, and I'm very observant, and I'm like, hey, you're stressing about all this stuff. Just worry about your lift. Of course, it's not my business. I say to myself, but I, yeah. I wonder why these cats bounce around, and it, it's peculiar. It's strange to me, because I'm like, how do you build that trust with that cat? Because like I said, on our third, on our third, uh, after our second, because I had planned for my last deadlift to be my second. And that would leave me a good wide range of, hey, we need to pull this to secure the W. And I trusted him in saying, hey, we don't need to lift that. Let's secure this. Be nine for nine. And we're in it. Like It's, it's very unlikely homeboy is going to pull 22 more pounds than he ever has before today. Right. And I trusted in my coach and handler that I said, okay, because y'all got to remember people who are listening uh, and have maybe not competed on the first part of me. You've got about 30 seconds to make your select. Like you don't have like five minutes to chill on the side and discuss when you do your lift, you have to walk directly to the table and say, Hey, we want this lift next. And everyone's rushing you because they have to keep the show going. So trust was, is so integral to the overall win and um i just don't see how guys can establish that trust and not kind of like i don't know not put that game plan together with much faith you know what i'm saying well doubling back to sheffield and we're um i mean even penna would say like that wasn't the total he wanted and it was less than his best but and it didn't it wasn't lined up with his gym lifts and what happens sometimes, what the handler has to do, the lifter will almost always believe they have more than they have in them on the day. And what the handler has to do is negotiate between this mm -hmm. being like, I understand and I know what you're capable of, but like, and not just Penna, but so many lifters will, that's why he misses third squat, third, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. third deadlift. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he's in his mind's eye, he's hit it. He hit it yep. in the gym. He could do this. But the handler has to be like, I understand. I love you. Have the tiger in you. You're supposed to as the athlete. You're supposed mm -hmm. to have that belief. But I am going to net you the win with the surest way possible, just in case mm -hmm. so we don't have an oopsie moment. So we don't have a moment where, fuck me, that, that bar came out of my hands on my third. Such and a I, fucking perfect way to say it, bro. Yeah. Man, it, yeah, it, you're it, killing it, dude. Yeah, it's 100% right. right. And and obviously, too, because I know a lot of guys cut way too much, period. Come on, I am a 66, and I've been a 66 for a long time. Probably longer than a lot of the field out there. You can't tell me this guy's not walking around close to 170 pounds. You, you just cannot tell me that. I don't care what they post. I don't care what they say. So you're not going to be the guy that can do the numbers you can do when you're walking around 170 pounds than the morning you had to be 145. It is impossible. I know because I've been there. You know what I'm talking about? I know that. So that's something, too, that a handler will have to make the lifter uh, refocus under that specific lens. Hey, you're not the guy that the bench press 420. You're the you're that was 15 pounds heavier. Right. You see what I'm saying? And there's been times my coaches had dialed me down and be like, Jay, let's be more conservative because we had the weight cut. But again, that comes that knowledge and that understanding, and that just kind of like, I get it. 
you're right, I'm wrong, comes from being a veteran, comes from being in those battles, and comes from those times we fucked up and we were too, and we just didn't have it on the day. The winner is the guy and will always be the guy or gal who executes their best total that they have for that day. Here. Yeah, yeah. that's what exactly that. And um, yeah, dude, holy smokes. I'm getting, you're firing me up for Worlds. Like, I can't wait to see Worlds you. Is gonna the be, Worlds is going to be awesome, dude. I told you, listen, I only told two people. I told you and I told Pete from SBD, I am going to shock everyone with my performance. Didn't I tell you? I messaged you. I said, be ready. And I told Pete, I said, Pete, I'm going to shock the entire power of the world with my performance. And mind you, the numbers that I hit were not the numbers I was thinking. We just chose those numbers. And I'll leave it at that. The total yeah. that I had um, in mind for myself, and while I was transparent with a lot of things, there was a couple things I kept in reserve. And, you know, we did have that variable of how I felt on the day with my back injury. And that played a big factor in well, ultimately where we ended up. But I knew for certainty the world record was going to fall. Period. And I have to do that. I'm very excited. Team USA is, and this is a, a whole different hype train than what Africa was. I don't know oh, if yeah. it was because Jesus' speech. I don't know, dude. But Russell, it, Russell, or he's back. Perkins is here. Like the team is stacked like we haven't seen exactly. maybe ever. This might be the greatest <laughs> team ever assembled since the Avengers. <laughs> maybe since the Avengers yeah. and Thanos came. And you guys yeah, have dude, Thanos and so Yeah. If yeah, Thanos comes if Thanos comes down, he better not choose Lithuania. Let me tell you that right now. Because he'll <laughs> he, he'll think, pack up. He'll pack up. He'll be like, I've seen this movie. I see I've seen how this ends before. Yeah. Dude, just just the sense of camaraderie I'm feeling, both on the men's and women's side just on like the, the group chats and everything I've been a part of. I awesome. think that we are all feeling a sense of heightened just unity as a team because it's so weird to say because powerlifting is a very much individual sport. But I'm planning to stay to watch all of my guys lift. Oh dude I that's mean awesome. I'm not yeah. gonna miss Jesus fucking lifting. I mean, that's literally like almost a week and a half, but I'm going to make it happen because how is it fair for me to go kick ass, represent my country, but also not stand in the crowd hyping my fellow countrymen up? That's that's not that's not going to happen on my watch. You know, he deserves the whole team there hyping him up, just like Russell, just like every single uh, Amanda everybody on that team i think the sense of unity that i at least coming from me and i can only speak on my perspective um the sense of unity and camaraderie that i'm already feeling it's nothing like i've ever experienced before um in powerlifting and i'll just leave it at that i think the team usa is on a whole different level dude and, it's um, amazing it, it you have to like soak it all up man if it's like you said this could be the last run take it all in and appreciate oh, yeah. the people appreciate the people because that's yeah. all part of it and it's and um yeah frick it'll be it'll be nuts i i you're gonna have a ball watching it i'm glad you guys got a group chat i'm glad you guys you'll remember each other forever you pass each other in 20 years from now you'll be like do you remember 2024 how wild mm -hmm. was lithuania lithuania is yeah. gonna have a special spot in your heart buddy i promise you i think i don't think i know the, the powerlifting community and world will talk about this lineup for years to come. And people will refer back and say, you remember that 2014? God, dang, there were some monsters. <laughs> this is going to de redefine powerlifting for the next couple of years, this competition. I feel it. I feel it. There'll be a whole... There'd be a whole redefinition of of what's possible. And I think the sport is going to grow after this world. There's so much talent. There's so many heavy hitters. World records are going to fall and fall and fall and fall that I think we're going to shake things up so much 
And Sheffield might as well be taking place in in Texas because save everybody some travel money. It's got it's got (laughs) even Ashton and Bob Matthews. And here's a beautiful thing: all you guys who 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 uh, do your damn thing get to reunite. It's like a reun uh, a reunion tour at Sheffield. Mm -hmm. It'll all be like, okay, gentlemen. By the end, you'll know who's going. You'll be to shake hands and be like. See you in Sheffield then, huh? See you later. Let's, let's, let's get the band back. The band's let's getting get back, the together. Band back together. Let's bring the boys it's back together. The, the boys gig. are back. The, yeah. the boy band comes back together. And, my dude, we have to have another night in Lithuania like we did at uh, the first PA Nats when we went out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's dude, do it. Drinks on me as always. Yeah, drinks on me as always. But, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, man. And Thank you so much for having me back on. Um, you know, um, it, it means a lot. And, you know, I, I regardless of this conversation being recorded or not, um, I very much enjoyed it, man. Some of the stuff you said um, meant a lot to me on, on a personal level, regardless of powerlifting and all this bullshit, man. I, I, I do appreciate some of the stuff you said, man. It's, it's, it's weird telling a story and being vulnerable as a man, but I think it is also important to let it out there because you don't know who you're going to inspire. And, and that's uh, I appreciate you giving me this platform and allowing me to share my story and hopefully inspire uh, a, a new generation of powerlifter. My man, thank you for coming on. The door is always open. First off, and I appreciate you being as look. You were strong on and off the platform. We already knew that, but to come back on the platform this platform and relive and talk from the heart and be as transparent as you are. You are stern stuff, my friend. You, uh, It's very, very admirable. And I'm, I'm not joking. If I live to be a hundred, I'm never going to forget you, dude. Uh, you mm-hmm. left your mark. You left your mark on me. I'm telling you that right now. And if you do your thing and you walk away from the sport after Sheffield were games or whatever, um, you left your mark. I already know you did. I know you want to leave a mark. You left your freaking mark, my man. I'll never forget you. I'll be telling Thank I'll you, be telling your story for years to come. And I'm glad this is digital and anyone can find it in the future and be like, God damn. Yes. <laughs> when, when they look up the 2024 US team, they're like, let me hear about the 2024 US team. Let me listen to some of their podcasts. Mm-hmm. They're gonna find mm-hmm. you and be like, damn. He was he was he was strong stuff on and off the platform. But thank oh, you, my amazing. man. Thank you for yes, coming yes, on. Yes, yes, yes. Much you appreciated. And uh, also, big yeah, yeah. thank you to SBD. Yes. My sponsor, SBD, for having my back, sticking with me when I was down, and sticking with me while I was up. That means so much to me. And I know how easy it is to sway the other way. So big thank you to Pete and everyone in SBD that I haven't met. Thank you guys for sticking with me. I promise I won't let you down. Thank you. There it is. News. And for everybody listening, as per usual, please do subscribe, give us high ratings, and until next time, six pack lap it at six up. We are out. Later, you